Uh, so thank you for that. Today's topic is how to dial in uh, real-time EQ and compression. Now, this is something that a lot of folks really struggle with when it comes to audio. It's hard enough to dial it in in post, right? I run entire courses that people pick up just to learn how to dial in their EQ, dial in their compression, and that's doing it in post-production. But today, I want to talk about how to dial it in for real-time, like live streaming, like podcasting if you're doing a live podcast or guest podcasting. So for for example, if you're going to be a guest on someone else's podcast and maybe you don't trust them to do a great job of processing, maybe they're not, you know, they're a great host but they're an amateur podcaster and you want the best sounding audio and you want to just take care of that audio on your own, well, you can use real-time processing so as it's getting recorded for their podcast, it's actually doing the EQ, the compression. It's touching up your audio, at least, on the way in. You'll have to pardon me. I got to keep wetting, wetting the whistle tonight. I, I did six discovery calls in a row today for my uh, coaching, consulting, speaking business. Um, and uh, I ran last night a, a two-hour workshop for a client, a communication workshop. So I've been, like, sitting here talking at my, you know, at my command center for just, like, days on end. But I, re I really wanted to do this live, especially before the baby comes. The baby is, due. my wife is, she is ready to pop. She is as pregnant as you can be, and the baby's due any day now. Hopefully, I've got enough content in the books. I've been trying to make videos in advance to at least keep one video a week coming out for the first few weeks while we have our very first born in the house. So that's that's coming very soon. So as I said, today's topic is real-time EQ and compression, how to dial in your, your sound for, uh, for live streaming, for guest podcasting, and, uh, and things like that. So uh, first, let's talk about what EQ is and what compression is real quick. Because in and of itself, I think this is one of the most valuable parts of my, my online courses is just really getting a clear understanding of what EQ is and what it's for, what compression is and what it's for. So... EQ stands for equalization. It stands for equalization. In other words, balance. EQ is all about balance. So the best way you can think about this is there's a frequency spectrum from very, very low tones to very, very high tones and everything in between. I'm sure that, that, that sounded beautiful. Then I'll scratch you in weird. So every single sound source in the real world, every audio source in the real world, not the digital world, but in the real world, has a range of frequencies. My voice is pretty deep, right? You'd think, well, my voice is mostly made of low frequencies. Well, it has a lot of low frequencies, but I also have mid-range frequencies and high-range frequencies that make up the total sound of my voice. And this is true for every sound that you hear. And what equalization plugins or EQ plugins allow us to do is to adjust the gain or the volume, if you want to think of it like that, but to adjust the gain of individual frequency bands. So we could take just a, a little bit of the mid-range, an exact spot of the mid-range of a sound source, and push it up or pull it down. And we could do that for anywhere in the lows or anywhere in the highs. We could go along and choose where in our frequency spectrum we want to push up or pull down any of the frequencies. And by doing that, instead of just raising the volume of the whole audio source or your voice or lowering it, you're only raising and lowering the volume of specific aspects of the voice. And the goal of EQ is to balance the voice. So if you've recorded a voice in a particularly bassy room, we could use EQ to take some of the bass out. If you've got voice in a particularly harsh sounding room or you've got a lot of very harsh high-pitched reflections maybe you're right over uh, a desk and there's a window behind you and there's all this this bright brittle reflections well we can take a little bit of that out maybe you're using a microphone that's maybe a little bit lower budget microphone and it has kind of a harsh hot top end well we can carve out some of those top end frequencies maybe your voice is really sibilant we can take out some of the some of the s's and and t's kind of that i don't have a very sibilant voice maybe your voice like mine has a lot of nasalness i have a real nasal problem in the five six hundred hertz range which is the mid range of of a human voice 
And so I could duck out a little bit of those to warm it up to, to get rid of some of that nasal quality. So EQ is for compression, at least subtractive. I'm sorry. What did I just say? EQ is for compression. EQ is for balance. It's for balancing out the tone. Now, you can also use EQ creatively, what we would normally call additive EQ, where you can also add frequencies to specifically achieve a certain kind of sound, right? To achieve a certain tone. So you could decide, I really want my voice to sound unnatural in a specific way for creative reasons. Well, you can do that with EQ as well. That's less what we're going to be dealing with today. And then compression. Compression deals with dynamic range. Dynamic range is all about the difference between the quietest parts and the loudest parts of a sound source, the quiet parts and the loud parts of a sound source. That's dynamic range, right? Now, when you think of uh, orchestral music, uh, classical music has really huge dynamic range. They can go from whisper quiet to unbelievably loud. Whereas rock and pop music, modern rock and pop music, has almost no dynamic range. It's the same volume the entire song. Everything's sitting in a very specific spot. There's nothing too quiet or too loud in there. Uh, if you've ever noticed that when you're trying to watch a movie at home late at night, that all of the action is too loud, but then the dialogue, you can't hear it, so you keep playing with the volume knob... That's because movies are made with wide dynamic range in order to produce that theatrical experience. But when you're trying to watch at home late at night and be quiet and not disturb other people, that's what creates that problem is because movies have wide dynamic range in order to create a cinematic experience. So having said all that, so compression is about smoothing out the dynamic range. What compression does is it reduces the difference between the quietest parts and the loudest parts of a sound source, right? The quiet parts here, the loud parts, the loudest parts here. And compression is going to, it's going to squash down the loudest parts by a certain amount. You could squash it just a little bit, or you could squash it a lot. Now, a lot of people think that compression actually makes things louder because you always hear in music that compression is the way to get your music louder. It's not actually true. Compression actually makes sound sources quieter. It's just that after we've compressed something, now we can raise the entire volume of that source, the gain of that source, because we have so much more headroom after we squash down the loudest peaks. Headroom is the difference between the loudest part of your sound source and zero dB, which is a brick wall in audio. Everything I'm saying right now, I've said on, on videos on my channel before, all of what I'm saying right now is in-depth explained with graphics and nice things that are easy to look at and understand in my courses, but this is just a basic overview before we actually start dealing with EQ and compression. Knowing that EQ is designed to balance the tone of the sound source, and the compression is designed to reduce the difference between the quietest parts and the loudest parts. And the reason that we do compression is so that if I randomly yelled or laughed or got excited, I don't blow out your eardrums. And if I get whisper quiet all of a sudden, you don't have to crank up the volume, right? We don't want our listeners to have to be constantly turning up and turning down their volume when they're just listening to a podcast or a live stream. Now, Having said all that, doing EQ and compression in real time can be CPU intensive and it can be or it can be very tricky to do. So a lot of people don't even know that it's possible to do it, that they think that you can only do it in post production. Well, that's not true. There are actually a lot of different ways, uh, some free and some paid and some very expensive uh, to to actually achieve the goal of EQ and compression during a live stream or in real time. So the way that it used to be done in the analog world was with physical boxes, uh, you know, an EQ box, a, a box that does compression, a box that does EQ, and they were analog. They were actually affecting the signal of the microphone on the way in before it got recorded or broadcast. And I have a video on my on this channel, on the Audio 101 channel. Um, I just realized that that banner is still at the bottom of my screen. I was on a roll there. Nobody told me that audio, uh, the, that banner was still there, um, which hopefully means you were so mesmerized by what I was saying that you didn't notice anymore either. Oh, that's so silly. That's going to be there forever in this, in, in, in the uh, recording of this live stream. Anyway, 
so we used to use uh, analog EQ and compression. So you'd affect the the signal before it ever got to the broadcast. And there was a video I did about the Joe Meek 3Q, which I still have. It's not currently plugged in. I don't use it in my chain anymore. But I did that video about six months ago at the beginning of the whole COVID lockdown kind of a thing as a way to, without bogging down my computer, get some EQ and compression to help me smooth out and process my audio for stuff like this. Now, having said that, there are ways to do it that don't involve complicated, tricky, analog pieces of gear that involve lots of extra cables. For one thing, if you're using OBS software, Open Broadcast Studio, which is free and very, very popular, although tricky to use, a big learning curve there, you can actually go to filters and apply an audio filter and choose any third-party plugin you want. Uh, you can choose a third-party VST in OBS. So you can use OBS, which is uh, which is free. Hello from Puerto Rico. Good to see you. Or Puerto Rico. Rico. I can roll my R, my R's. Puerto Rico. Did I get that? I feel I feel like I'm not intending to to do a parody. I'm trying to say it for real. Uh, Puerto Rico. Shaggy. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna call you Shaggy unless you tell me something else to call you. Um, so you can use OBS to to put EQ and compression plugins on. You can also use uh, one of my favorite programs, which is Audio Hijack. This is a Mac exclusive program. It costs, I don't know, I want to say 50 or 60 bucks. Really, really phenomenal uh, program that's very, very powerful for audio processing in real time. Uh, but today, we're actually going to be using the mix software, the mixer software for this unit right here, which is, <laughs> I, my picture in picture is is set to the wrong. Hang on, let me just change which uh, which camera my picture in. Oh my goodness! Well, that that ain't right. All right, hang on. Let's turn off the picture in picture. Those were my uh, that was those were my settings from a. Uh, hang on, let me bring this back. No, hang on. Let me get my A10 Mini to uh, to work with me here. Those are my settings from from a, a client uh, a workshop I was doing for a client earlier, and they're not they're not helpful with what I'm doing right now. Anyway, let's take a look at this. This is the uh, Tascam 208i audio interface, and it's a four channel interface. I just put up a review and an overview on earlier this week on my channel, and it's it's deceptively powerful. This is an expensive interface. This is a $400 interface, which you might be thinking, wow, like I usually spend a hundred bucks, 120, 150 bucks on an interface. And that that's, you know, for most people, 100, 120 bucks on an audio interface is more than you ever need to spend. Well, one of the things that you get with this interface is this, which is the Tascam uh, 208i mixer uh, software here. And this mixer software, I showed this in the video, but I'm going to go into a live demo here for you. What I'm able to do is actually use here in the uh, in the software, I'm able to actually use um, EQ and compression in real time. So none of it's on right now. And I have three different microphones plugged in. So let me just uh, show you that again. The microphones that are plugged in right here on channel one is the microphone I'm using right now, which is the Movo VSM7 that is sat right in front of my face. The next one is the Audio-Technica AT875R, which is up overhead uh, out of frame. And the last one I've got over here is actually the Shure SM58. Uh, which is sitting on a stand here uh, that I'll get to in a little bit, a desktop stand. So I'm going to show you here how to use the mixer software here for the 208i. Uh, but like I said, this is not specific to this software. These are principles you can use for EQ and compression to deal with a, uh, a live stream. And this will be true for absolutely... Um, absolutely any EQ and compression that you use. You don't need this software, but one of the reasons I just adore 
this audio interface and I was so thrilled to do a review about it is because not only are they pro grade incredible preamps that sound warm and wonderful and amazing like by the way there's no EQ or compression on my voice right now this is actually what the preamp sounds like in combination with this lovely microphone from Movo without any EQ and compression and honestly in and of itself this preamp and the fact that there's four of them built into this interface to me, that's worth 400 bucks. Now, that's a lot of money. There's no doubt that's a lot of money. But this preamp is levels above the $100, $150 entry-level uh, audio interface preamps that you normally get. But to top it off, having this mixer where I can actually use EQ and compression, you see that they just lit up as I engaged them, but neither of them is set to anything right now. They're not pumping at all. They're not working at all. And so, right now, we are exclusively looking at the Movo VSM7, which I have right here. And I'm going to start playing with the EQ. The first thing I'm going to do is always enable a low cut filter. Do you see how it immediately did this slope right here? Uh, this slope that is starting at 80 hertz, which you can see right there. Now, tell me in the chat if you if you want me to make this full screen. Is it easier to see this if it's full screen, or would you like me to keep my face in the frame? Just somebody let me know, or take take a vote. Everybody, just vote real quick in the chat. Should I leave it full screen while I'm doing this demo, or do you want to be able to see my face at the same time? Uh, just let me know real quick in the chat which is easier for you. I imagine if you're watching this on a, uh, a phone or a small tablet, it would be easier if you could see the mixer full screen. But uh, with the face, okay. Uh, split screen, okay. I got two split screen votes right away. There we go. Split screen for Paul and, and split screen for Shaggy. We will keep it like this. That's good. I feel like I can have a more conversation, per, more personal conversation with you all then. So I've got this low cut filter. Now a low cut filter is going to cut out the low frequencies. And the human voice has nothing usable below 70 hertz, 80 hertz, somewhere in there. A really deep male voice, kind of like mine, is probably pushing 70 hertz as the lowest frequencies that are usable. And so... You'll see that what happens here is um, I don't have any gain options here. I've got this 80 hertz low frequency filter set. Now, listen as I move this up. As I move it up, you will actually hear that all of the low of my voice just disappeared, right? It's completely gone. The low of my voice is gone. Now, you have to be listening on headphones or good earbuds uh, to, to hear this. You will not hear this if you're using your phone speakers or your, your, uh, your tablets built in speakers or your laptops built in speakers. So all of the low end, I just did a low cut filter at one kilohertz, at one kilohertz, which is ridiculous. Uh, but if I back this off, ooh, there's the low end in my voice again. Now I'm all the way done letting everything in. But what happens is if I'm letting everything in, you can hear that there's there's too much low end. It's rumbly. It's boomy. It's way over bassy. And so if I bring this up to 80 hertz, somewhere in that range, I'm just going to tighten up the low end. I still have the deep power of my voice, but I can tighten up that low end. And especially if you had like a, a computer fan that was kicking on really hard or some air conditioning in the background or something, you could push this up to 100, 125, 150, and you'd lose a little bit of the low end of the voice, but you'd get rid of some of that background fan noise, and that would be really, really useful. So since I don't have any of that and I'm in a, uh, a, you know, a professionally treated home studio, I'm just going to leave this at 80 hertz. Okay, next thing is that I have a, uh, well, one thing that you might want to do that I won't need to is take a look at the 200 or 250 hertz range, kind of 2 to 300, 2 to 400 hertz. That's where you'll notice a voice sounds boxy if you're recording in a uh, or if you're doing a live stream in like a, a bedroom in your house like a spare bedroom or something that boxy sound happens because a bedroom is literally a box with parallel 
walls and a ceiling and a floor that are parallel to each other. And so you'll notice that in a room like that, see, you're not going to hear as much of it in here because this is like a balanced, treated home studio, you know, with audio treatment. But in a normal bedroom situation that's not like this, like what, like my guest room, which is not treated, there's just, you know, a bed and a dresser and stuff in there for a guest. That room would have a problem where it would feel like there was a blanket over the voice. And so watch what happens if I take out a bunch of the... Uh, I just took out a huge amount, six decibels in that 250 hertz range. And right away, you hear that it actually it actually clears up the voice a little bit. Now, this is excessive, right? I'm doing this as an example. It, it Now I've lost a lot of the power of my voice, but you can hear that what it's done is take it, it's taken away some of that boxy sound, that, that sound of uh, there being a blanket over, over the voice. So let's just come back and reduce maybe 4 dB, maybe 3 dB of that, and we're in good shape. Now, I told you that my voice in particular has an issue with the nasal quality. And that nasal quality for me, I just know from my own voice, is right around 550 or 600 hertz. This is something you'll have to experiment with for yourself. And all of these things I'm talking about right now, by the way, are subject to the mic you're using and your proximity to it, which is why I'm going to show you this with two other mics in two different other types of scenarios in a moment because I want you to be able to hear how even we can't just immediately duplicate these settings when we switch to a different mic. We can use them as a starting point, and we might have to tweak them from there. So, okay, back to 600 hertz. This is where I have a nasal quality. You're used to hearing my voice, so you might not realize it, but listen, if I take out, say, 6 or 8 decibels of 600 hertz, and I boost up the Q to, say, 4, Four. Now, what is the Q? The Q, if you're watching right here, is how narrow or wide the frequency band is. We don't want it to be wide when we are cutting. This is a principle I teach in my audio course to all of my students, which is you're going to cut narrow and boost wide. This is the best principle for EQing. Cut narrow, boost wide. Okay? So, I'm taking out uh, with a fairly steep, a fairly narrow band right here. I am I took out 8 dB. That's way too much. I just wanted you to hear that that gets rid of the nasal quality in my voice. Now, if I'm just going to bring that back to a reasonable amount, I have a pretty bad issue with nasalness. So let's take out 4 dB at 600 hertz with a fairly steep Q. So now we've taken care of some of the boxiness that I don't have in this room as much, and I could even maybe make that a little bit less aggressive by bringing that Q up so it's a little bit more narrow there. And I took out some of the nasal quality. Now I have a fairly dark voice, and this particular mic is a fairly dark mic, and I'm getting the proximity effect because I'm so close to the mic right now. So I can take the high range, maybe in the 8 kilohertz range, where we would call, we, we would call this clarity, and I can boost up maybe three decibels up there, and suddenly what you're hearing right now is what you would expect a processed, produced voice to sound like when it comes to EQ. Listen to the difference if I undo the EQ and then turn it back on. Ready? This is the neutral, natural sound that you were hearing for the first 30 minutes of this live stream, and this is the EQ'd version of my voice, and I'm doing that in real time. Tell me... Tell me in the chat how much better that sounds. I mean, that sounds... Now, it sounds less natural, but it sounds produced. It sounds polished. It doesn't sound rough around the edges anymore. And this is the advantage of doing EQ. Now, if all you were going to do was EQ, you would be very, very happy with the results. If you didn't even deal with compression, if you just did EQ, you would be thrilled. But let's move over to the compressor over here. The key to a compressor, and I cannot teach all of this here because this is like, th this takes video after video. This is lesson after lesson after lesson in my audio courses. Compression is really tricky and it takes me hours to teach it for real in my audio courses. But here, I'm going to set my ratio at a uh, four to one. So for every four decibels that it's going to address, it's only going to allow one decibel. So for every four decibels I get louder, this compressor at a four to one ratio is gonna squash it back to one. 
Now I'm going to set a 4 millisecond attack and a 40 millisecond release, a quick attack and a quick release, which means that the compressor is going to end up kicking in pretty much on every word and letting go with every word so it doesn't hold on through all the words and get mushy. Again, this stuff I, I spend a lot of time teaching in my courses. And then I'm going to back off the threshold. And, and the threshold is the decibel level at which the compressor kicks in. You'll notice there's nothing happening right now. Oh, we just saw a little bit of it. You see that? You see that right here? Right here. It's just starting to kick in. If I back it off a little bit more and somewhere around minus 12, maybe minus 15. Yeah, okay. So there we go. Somewhere around minus 15 is when we're getting some real compression. So let's put that maybe around minus 12 right there. Oh, you know what? Let me go overboard. I'm going to go overboard so you can hear what the compressor is doing. It's not letting me get any louder, right? It's keeping me down. This is making my voice quieter and really weird sounding. But if I put it around minus 14, minus 13, now we're getting somewhere in the range of three, four, maybe five decibels of compression, which you can see right here. And since we're reducing the loudest parts by three, four, maybe five dB at the most, we can now boost after the compressor by the same amount. And so here you have a produced sounding voice with the EQ and the compression. And just to give you how big a difference this has made, here it is without any of the EQ and compression on, and here it is with the EQ and the compression on at the same time. Again, no EQ, no compression. This is the natural sound. And here is the EQ and the compression. Now, typically when you do compression like we're doing right now, you will find that it makes the voice a little bit uh, a little bit brighter, a little bit uh, harsher, and so this high, these high, uh, this, this 3 dB here that I did, I could probably back off. I probably don't need maybe just 1 dB of a high range here just to balance that back out. And there you go. We've done EQ and compression in real time, so we have a polished, processed, produced sound uh, in, in, in a live stream, which is a wonderful thing. It also means if I get really extra loud all of a sudden, it's not going to blow out your eardrums because that compressor, if I get way too loud, you see the compressor just kick in here and it keeps it from blowing out your eardrums, which is uh, something that your listeners will appreciate as well, especially if you laugh really hard all of a sudden. You see, normally when people laugh hard all of a sudden on a live stream, it just distorts and clips and blows out people's ears. So I'm going to quickly show you what it's like to do this with a very different, very, very different sound, which is the, uh, Ollie, don't worry, I see you just said I'm too late. I'm still in the middle of doing it all, and this will be live on the replay. I'm going to let the, re the replay of this stay up uh, for... I don't know, for perpetuity or something like that. By the way, those of you who've, who've stuck along, who, who've been here this long, I'm going to be offering uh, some, in, I'm going to be offering an interesting discount uh, just for those of you who are here on the live stream, which will only be valid today for my audio 101 for content creators course. And I have an interesting announcement to make at the end. So uh, those of you who have uh, been here live and in real time, you'll benefit from that. Thank you for being here. Uh, okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch you over to, here we go, hang on, I'm going to switch you over to the Audio-Technica AT875R, which is sitting up above me right now. So undoubtedly, this sounds very, very different. You'll see that it's actually this one right here the second channel, and like I said, that's the Audio-Technica AT875R, which is a shotgun mic, right? It's a, uh, it's a condenser shotgun mic, and it's going into channel two. Uh, it's going into channel two of the um, Tascam 208i. So, <laughs> and now you jumped into a tin can. Yeah, okay, so, so Paul, you bring up a great point. I'm going to bring this over a little bit further. I want, you can see that it's actually, let's see, let me show you. So can you see that it's just in camera right now? So what I'm going to do is make sure it's just out of frame. Okay. Just out of frame. So you can't see it. This is, 
This is the sound of the Audio-Technica AT875R, and that is what a shotgun mic sounds like. Now, a shotgun mic is going to give you the uh, the tone of the room, right? It's not going to sound, it's never gonna sound as isolating as this. This is an unnatural sound, right? When I'm up really close, like a broadcaster to this. This is actually more of a natural sound. You hear a little bit more of the reflections off of my desk and a little bit more of the room. It feels like I'm in a room with you. Now, that can be a good thing. You can use it to effect. But if you have noise in the background and stuff, shotgun mics can be a little problematic. Having said that, let's let's use the EQ to our advantage. So, now we're going to go into our EQ and the first thing I'm going to do is, again, turn on that low cut filter and set it to 80 hertz. No issue with that. But the next thing I'm going to do is, actually, you know what? I'm not going to turn on the low cut filter this time. You know why? I'm going to use this low frequency to boost a little bit of the low end of this mic. I'm going to boost this up a little bit. Now, this is too much, but you hear how we're starting to already get rid of that tin can sound because I'm boosting up the low end, giving us a little bit more warmth the way we had over here. Now, this was a very tight controlled low end. This low end we're hearing right now is a little unwieldy, so I don't want to do too much of that. We'll just do maybe 3 dB of the low end to get a little bit more uh, to, to compensate for the fact that it's further away from uh, from my mouth, right? Okay, now we're gonna go into the low mids. I hear that there's some uh, some of that low mid buildup right now. So let's see if I take out, let's go to a somewhat narrow and then pull down maybe four dB or so in that 200 Hertz range. Let's see, maybe in the 300 Hertz range. I'm gonna turn up my own headphones just a little bit so I can hear what I'm doing even better. All right, right there, maybe somewhere around there. Yeah, somewhere around 250 or 300. Uh, I'm finding that this is going, this is balancing out a little bit. Now, I, I find that there's still a little bit too much low end there. So I'm going to back that off a little bit more. Okay, now we've got a little bit of that low end we've added. We've cleaned up some of the, some of the mids. Let's actually make that a little bit wider of a cut. All right, so... We cleaned up some of the low mids. I'm going to go back and address and see if I can deal with some of that nasalness. That nasalness that I have, it comes out in every mic. It just, it's really obnoxious. So let's take out some of that nasalness right there. Okay, and now I probably don't want to boost the high end in this case because watch what happens if I boost the high end. This is already a mic that's sounding brighter than normal and it's sounding brighter because it's further away from me and it's picking up some of the reflections off the desk because it's pointed down at me and everything like that. So those, the high frequencies here, they're going to over accentuate some of the stuff we already don't like about this. What you could do instead is you can actually back off just a little bit and that would give you a chance to, uh, let's say, what was this? Just started looking in. Hey, Hank, good to see you. Yeah, you'll catch all the rest of this, uh, Hank, a little bit uh, a little bit later on the replay. I think you'll find it really valuable. So I just backed off a little bit of those highs. Now, I've only got four bands to work with in this particular EQ. If you were using a different EQ uh, or if you were using a third-party EQ, uh, you could have a million bands and do anything you want. So maybe here what I would try is to bring some of the clarity out by going to about 5K and giving myself a little bit of extra boost, a wide boost at five or six kilohertz right there to get some of the clarity back into my voice. Maybe that's something I would do and I could adjust it like this. So here is a way to take the uh, the Audio-Technica AT875R shotgun mic and make it a little bit more produced. And here you go. This is without the EQ on. There's no EQ on at all right now. And this is with the EQ on. It's a little bit tighter. It's a little bit more broadcasty. I can bring up the low end maybe a little bit more now and turn the EQ off. You hear that it's just kind of in a tin can. And with the EQ on, we've got it a we brought out the voice a little bit more and got rid of a little bit of that room noise. And as you can see, this is kind of a complicated process here. Now we're gonna be real careful with the compression because Anytime you have some background noise going on, when you compress, you're also going to make the background noise more 
prominent because compression, again, reduces the distance between the quietest and the loudest source. So if your voice is the thing that's most important and then you compress, the noise floor is always going to sound louder because you've reduced the dynamic range. So noise gets louder. Background noise gets more prominent with compression. So I want to be careful about compressing an overhead mic like this. Let's be real gentle. Let's do maybe a, uh, a two, two and a half to one ratio. We'll still do the same uh, attack and release. Doesn't uh, It's always going to be that. And then back off the threshold until we're getting just a little bit. Just No, that's way too much. Okay, that's way too much. This is just so that if I randomly get really loud, it just doesn't go crazy. And then I can boost the overall by roughly that amount. And now we've got the, uh, the compression working in our favor. So now this is the normal sound, the natural unprocessed sound of the AT875R. And here you have the compressed and EQ'd sound, which again, sounds a lot more uh, processed. And you'll probably notice, did you notice that the exact same thing happened this time, which is once we did the compression, all of a sudden, the uh, everything sounded a little bit too bright. So I think that that four decibels I did of clarity boost in the 6K range uh, is too much now that I've done compression. I can back that off a little bit. And here is a little bit more balanced sound, still sounds produced, still sounds processed. Now we're in really, really good shape. I don't know if it's necessary for me to do, I, I had brought with me, I, I have set up the Shure SM58, which is a dynamic, very woolly, dark sounding mic, um, which I can go through this. Let me know if you want to see me go through this process one more time, or you're like, okay, I got it. I can rewatch this. I don't need another mic right now. Um, I had it with me in case it's something that you would all want to uh, want to see. Um, and just for what it's worth, here I'm going to switch while you're all deciding if you want to see one more mic. I'm going to switch back to this so you can hear the difference when I switch back. So, now I have switched back to the uh, to the Movo VSM7, and clearly this is going to sound bigger and fuller. It has to because it's sitting right next to me, right? I mean, I'm I'm right up on this thing here. Versus, now I'm on the Audio Technica AT875R. What's interesting is you'll notice that's not as big a difference as when we had not done the processing, right? That's not nearly as drastic a jump. I see Ali says he would like to see uh, using, oh, I know why Ali wants to see me do the Shure SM58, because Ali, you use similar dynamic microphones for your podcast. So you'd definitely like to uh, you see that. And Shaggy says, yes, I got it, which by the way, I take that as a compliment, meaning I've done a good job live in real time of explaining this stuff. Um, so I'll take that as a compliment. But also, yeah, I think let's let's do it. Let's do it. So... Okay, hang on, hang on. I have to adjust my desk a little bit here. All right, you should be able to hear me now on the Shure SM58. Um, I'm, I should, I should put a pop filter on this though, because if I don't put a pop filter on this, you're gonna, you're gonna hear those pops all, uh, all night. Oh yeah, and Ali. You're thinking of getting the SM57. I highly recommend the SM57 for spoken word. The mic doesn't look sexy. Like it's not like a cool mic to put in front of your 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 face. But if what you're concerned with is audio quality, oh yeah, the SM57 is going to uh, definitely do you good. And Paul, you use a Shure SM7B, which is very very similar to the SM58. Um, so okay, let's do this. Let me just get a at least a pop filter. Hang on. I should have one of these with an arm's reach in my drawer. There we go. All right, at the very least, this foam windscreen, this is not a pop filter, it's a foam windscreen, uh, but this should, oh, I've got one of these too. All right, foam windscreen and pop filter. Now we're in good shape. Okay, and by the way, putting a foam windscreen and a pop filter on something like the SM58 also does you a favor by forcing you to get a little bit, like two inches further away, so that you can't uh, you can't actually get too close to that proximity effect. For example, a lot of people get right up here on the SM58. Oop, hang on. 
I'm clipping. A lot of people get right up here on the SM58, and then it really sounds woolly and dark and awful, whereas... When I get right here, it doesn't sound nearly as woolly or dark or awful because I'm being forced to get about two inches away. So this has like double benefit. We get the pop filter. We avoid p -p -p all the plosives. Uh, I wish if if only if only uh, Bandrew from a podcast is was watching, I would I would go please say pizza pronto. Um, by the way, I am so obsessed with podcastage, uh, and I love Bandrew's work. If you all watch podcastage which i'm sure you do if you watch my channel uh comment on his channel as many times as, don't be annoying but comment that he should do a collaboration with me or a live stream with me or something i would love just a little nudge he already knows who i am because he shared one of my uh, comments on one of his videos recently and he loved what i had said about vinyl records and whatever else but it would be uh, instead of me reaching out to him cold through an email, it'd be cool. If some of you um, said, "Hey, you know, you should have you seen this guy? You should do a live stream with Brian. That would be great. I'd appreciate that." Um, okay. By the way, uh, uh, also Shaggy, that's uh, that's that's great. Yeah, we'll we'll get to the uh, the courses and stuff like that in just a moment here. Let's quickly just run through. I'm not going to really do the explanation as I go through it this time. I'm just going to do it because now you understand my thought process as I'm going through. So let's start with EQ. I'm definitely going to do the low cut. I'll do it at 80 hertz. We'll start there. Then I'm going to deal with some of the, the really woolly frequencies here uh, that happen in the Sure SM58. So let's take out just maybe two decibels, kind of low, 200, maybe 175, something like that. I'm going to go right to the 600 and deal with the nasal quality in my voice. This may not be true for your voice. You may find yourself always going to two kilohertz to take something out because your voice has a bad buildup of frequencies there. Uh, so that would be something. So there. And also, by the way, SM58 and the SM57, they are mid-forward microphones. They have nasalness to begin with, um, and so it just compounds on my voice. Already you're hearing how much clear this is, and then we definitely want to do a clarity bump for the SM58. Not too much, just a little bit. And just like that quickly, here's what the EQ off, this is what the SM58 sounds like. And here's what the EQ on. This is all of a sudden sounding, I mean, this sounds like a, a much more expensive microphone very, very quickly. And I'm not even doing this in post. I'm doing this in real time, which is, uh, again, again, one of the reasons that I love this interface. If you can find $400 for the four input interface here, the Tascam 208i, or, or, if you can find $300 for the two-channel one, they make a two-channel version of this that comes with the same software, I think you'd be very, very happy between the preamps in this thing, the feature set, and the mixer. And by the way, Tascam has nothing to do with this live stream I'm doing right now, even though I am in an ongoing collaboration with them. I, the live stream I'm doing using this is because I love this device and I wanted to teach you something and it made sense to teach you with this. They didn't ask me to do this. They're not paying me to do this just for what it's worth. I always tell you when I've been, when I, when I'm doing a video that's part actually made as part of a collaboration or as a sponsorship. Um, okay. So now let's go to compression. Uh, by the way, you'll notice the SM58. Good morning, all the way off in Australia. It must be morning there, yeah. I know it's morning because one of my Australian clients just emailed me uh, just about uh, 30 minutes before this live stream. So I figured uh, she must be up for the day over there. Good to see you, my friend. Business firm in the house. All right. All the all the fun folks are here. It's hard to figure out when to schedule a live stream. So I, I tried to go for a good time. I think the only person I, I upset with this timing is my wife because it's like it's like dinner time for us. But she was OK with it. She's so pregnant. She was just like, yeah, whatever. I'm going to lie on the couch. Um, OK, let's go to the compression real quick. You'll notice that because this is a dynamic mic, it sounds compressed already. Dynamic mics, in my experience, tend to have a natural sound, uh, kind of a natural sounding compression more than uh, condenser mics do. And, and that's because dynamic mics actually have, s tend to have smaller frequency responses and smaller dynamic range. They're less sensitive, so they feel a little bit compressed to begin with. Uh, having said that, let's turn on the compression. 
here we go. Uh, we're going to dial this in at a nice, healthy 4 to 1. Attack, 4, release, 40. Back the threshold off until we're doing just a little bit, just getting the peaks right there. For me, because I always set my uh, my input game properly, it's always right around minus 12. By the way, if you set your input game properly, and say it with me, everybody, your input gain should be set between minus 9 and minus 12 dB, right? Between minus 9 and minus 12 dB. If that's where you set your input gain, you're always going to find the threshold is somewhere between minus 10 to minus 15. That's where your compression threshold is going to be. So even though I always say with compression, you have to think about the threshold every single time. If you set your input game properly, you have to do a lot less thinking. And now let's just boost this up by two, maybe three decibels to get that back in. And oh, listen to that. The SM58 sounding like a super much more expensive microphone. So here we go. This is the SM58 without any processing. And this is the SM58 with EQ and compression. Listen to the sound of that. Now, let's do a quick AB between the SM58 and the SM, I'm sorry, the SM58 and uh, from Shure and the Movo VSM7, my, my current favorite um, kind of budget-friendly large diaphragm condenser. Here we go. Okay, you are now listening. This is the SM, uh, here we go. Sorry, I want to make sure that everything sounds right. This is the VSM7. You are listening right now to the VSM7 with all of the EQ and compression that we've done. This is the VSM7. And this is the Shure SM58. This is the Shure SM58 with the EQ and compression. This is the Shure SM58 with all that EQ and compression that we've done. This is the Shure SM58 with all of that EQ and compression. And this is the SM, uh, the uh, VSM7. This is the VSM7 with all of the EQ and compression that we've done. This is the VSM7. And those are very different sounds. I mean, these are very, very different sounds. I'm going to stick to the uh, the, the kind of... You know the 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 podcasting setup right now. Uh, those are very different sounds, but the point isn't to make each mic sound like each other mic, right? They're not to make each mic. Uh, oh yes, Paul, the condenser is brighter. The condenser is always going to be brighter. And you know what's interesting? It's not that it's brighter. It's that it has more clarity, which is why even though you're only listening with iPad speakers, you could hear the difference. And this is really important. The clarity that you're getting with a condenser mic is because it is so much more sensitive. It'll pick up everything that all those mouth noises I just did an audio critique video about the other day, uh, last week maybe, and that's going to pick it up. But it also means it's going to get all of the nuance in your voice. Whereas the uh, a dynamic mic like the SM58 sounds it has like the the quality of like a, a filter on Instagram. It it is a a less accurate sound that tends to smooth things over, which can be really useful if you're not in a in a well treated room. So, okay, we made it through all of the actual tutorial stuff I wanted to do live here for free. How great is the internet? I I went to school for audio where it cost tens of thousands of dollars a year and took an entire semester to learn everything we just learned in the last hour. Uh, so I'm, I'm so glad that, that you, you are all here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to toss a few things on the screen. The first thing is uh, I'm going to toss this code uh, today only. This is over at 1 a.m. my time. So this is over in five hours. Uh, in the next For the next five hours, you will get $30 off uh, the Audio 101 for Content Creators course, which is my my course, just what it sounds like. It's audio for content creators. It's not just for podcasters. It's not specific. It, it deals with audio for video, audio for audio, and it's a. Uh, some of you here watching this have have gone through that course, have purchased it. Thank you so much for doing that, by the way. And anybody who's gone through it will tell you the course is awesome. I went out of my way. It's four hours of instruction 
over 30 videos and I just started making some new updates. I'm like, you know, it's been about a year since I released that course. I've been making some 2020 updates uh, based on feedback from, from people who've gone through it. That course is normally only 97 bucks, which honestly, I know it's my course and I'm biased, but it's four hours of audio instruction, completely comprehensive to st from start to finish for content creation. And it's only $97. Um, you can get it for 30 bucks off for the next five hours. Use that code right there. Um, so I'll leave that up for a second. And while you uh, while I leave that up for you, let me say this. I have a new course I've been working on since May. It is massive. It is serious. It is nearly eight hours of instruction. And it's not for amateurs. If you just make a YouTube channel or a podcast with your friends just for fun, it's probably not for you. And you'll know that as soon as I tell you the title, which is Podcasting for Professionals. Podcasting for Professionals. It's for serious podcasters, whether you not, – not to make a living by podcasting, but professionals – who podcast, right? If you're a, if you work for an organization in the marketing department and they've asked you to run a podcast for the organization. If you are self-employed or an entrepreneur, or freelancer, or even on even part-time, but you use podcasting as part of your business, even if your business is part-time, then you are a professional who does podcasting. So, that course is going to launch in I think January for the the full final version of that course is going to launch December, maybe January, and it's going to be a $500 course. So it's not for the faint of heart. It's a serious course with almost eight hours of audio instruction. That's not just audio. It's going to take you through everything. I see Paul said, sign me up, but he probably didn't hear the price yet. Right. <laughs> um, so that's going to have eight hours of instruction. Uh, and it's going to take you through not just all the audio, including how to do remote interviews, how to do um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I had, I had a feeling Paul, but don't, don't tune out because good news is coming because you're here on this live stream. Good news is coming. Um, uh, that is a serious course because that's an investment for professionals. And it also deals with the mindset it deals with. Um, so Ali, it deals with gear, all microphone, everything that you like, it's like a higher end, more in-depth version of all the stuff in the audio 101 course, but then it goes, it's all specifically for podcasters. So types of microphones, types of audio interfaces, what to look for there, software, how to use different software. It goes into all of that, goes into routing and signal change and things like that. It goes into recorders and recording settings and all of that. But it also goes uh, into all the mindset of finding your voice, how to be a podcaster, how to do outreach for interviews, how to how to book uh, uh, unbelievable guests on your podcast, how to eventually be able to book like like the dream guests and celebrities, how to conduct an interview, how to follow a narrative um, and lead your guest to the kind of conversations you want to get out of them, how to um, use your podcast to to help your business and everything like that, right? So it's a very comprehensive course. And here's the thing. I am offering to anybody who wants to be a beta tester, I'm going to launch the course on like October, like the first week of October, very, very soon. In like two weeks, I'm going to launch the course in beta. I haven't finished all the videos yet. I got like 85% of it done. It's taking forever and I got a baby coming in a week. So I'm going to launch it with everything that's already there and I'll put placeholders for the lessons that don't exist yet that I'm going to make. And it'll say what the lesson's going to me and it'll just be a placeholder. Anybody who'd like to be a beta tester, go through the course seriously and give me feedback, give me advice. What really helped you? What was missing? What would you like to see? I'm offering that to beta testers for $97. Just for 97 bucks, you will get access to the course forever. As long as the course exists, it will be you'll have you'll be able to access it. So once it goes full live in January and the whole thing's there, you just get to keep using it. You never have to pay anything extra. There's never additional fees. I'm only looking for 10 beta testers, and I've already got a couple of folks who signed up. I offered this already to folks who've purchased the Audio 101 course already. You're the second group I'm offering it to, which is the folks watching live on this stream right now. I'm only accepting 10 for beta testers. 
Ali, amateurs are allowed if you're willing to pay the 97 bucks, as long as you're going to go through it seriously. Paul, I'd love to have you. As long as you're willing to go through it, Ollie, seriously, and give me, you know, give me the feedback and and let me know, you know, hey, I would have liked to know more about this here or that that lesson was the best lesson, and you know, whatever the feedback is, that'll help me fig, because you'll help me as beta testers figure out how to market this thing by giving me advice and giving me feedback and. I'm even going to throw in a bonus, the beta testers, I'm going to do a handful of private live stream, uh, not not private live streams, private group coaching calls to help you start to develop your podcast and get your specific questions answered. We'll do it in Zoom where we can all see each other and hang out. Um, so the beta testers will get access to that. And I got to tell you something, I, I, I coach, part of my business is coaching and anybody who, who coaches here knows how much you charge for that. I charge... $400 an hour for coaching. I'm just going to throw in a couple of group coaching sessions for this. So um, I'm, I'm doing my best to just say, I need people to be willing to go through this course when it's not finished yet and it's rough around the edges to help me out while I've got a baby um, and I can just focus on the baby and in exchange have the course for next to nothing and do some group coaching on me. Um, so having said all that, let's see, I've got Ollie's in Paul's in. Um, so here's what I need y'all to do. If you'd like to uh, to do that, send an email to audio101cc at gmail.com with the subject line beta. Audio101cc at gmail.com, subject line beta. I will uh, send you a um, a link or an invoice or whatever. I'll, 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 I'm going to work that out this weekend. By the end of this weekend, I will reach out to you and tell you how to pay. And then in like two weeks, the beta will go live and you'll start having access to to that. So you can spend the month of October going through that while I'm dealing with having an infant in the house for the first time and being on no sleep. Um, okay. I think we made it through everything. Craig, uh, today's live stream will be uploaded as soon as YouTube uploads it. Um, you'll be able to watch this replay. YouTube has lately been taking a long time, sometimes 24 hours to process a live video. Um, but I'm going to leave this replay up. And anybody who's watching the replay and interested, like, can I still get in on the beta run or anything like that? Uh, Craig's in, love it. Um, anybody who wants in on the beta run who's watching this replay, just send that email, and if I still have some of those 10 slots available, I'll let you know, and you can jump in. Um, yeah, I think uh, you could show us how to remove the sound of a crying baby in real time. You know what? I actually know how to remove the sound of a crying baby in real time. Um, it's just a really expensive plugin that you have to pay for. I won't remove it completely, um, but it's actually one of my favorite plugins that I talk about a lot, and I actually demo in the podcasting for professionals course it's it's one of the uh it's one of the uh isotope rx plugins which are like the the premium holy grail of audio repair uh plugins they're they're wonderful so um okay here's what i'm gonna do i'm going to yeah, leave the room that's how you get rid of a crying baby in real time exactly exactly um oh man okay so does anybody have any specific questions uh that they would like to uh that they'd like to ask uh any specific questions that uh you have for your own work anything i've done recently on the channel or any comments like certain types of videos that i've made recently that you're like yeah make more of those um you know whatever uh obviously i oh i have i have a big gear review coming um, in a couple weeks about that Tascam Model 12, that giant mixing console you've seen in so many of my videos recently. That is coming in about two weeks. Um, it's that thing, this thing, it's sitting here. You can't see it from where, but it's incredible. I'm excited to show you about that. That's part of this sponsorship collaboration I'm doing with Tascam, but the thing is so good. I'm not giving it back. Um, I definitely recommend though, uh, checking out, oh, somebody asked a little while ago, somebody asked about this, uh, who asked about, let's see where, oh gosh, somebody asked, I'm scrolling back. Somebody asked, oh, how would you compare? There it is, Paul. How would you compare the preamp and the task? I'm using the preamps and the roadcaster pro. That is a great question. So here, here's what I'm going to say on that. The preamp, oh, <laughs> I get 
th- this was better lit up earlier. My uh, my uh, aperture Amaran. I, I'm still using this A L M N that I made a video on like four years ago on my main channel. Um, it must have just burned out a battery. Um, I had that uh, lighting this up, but this. Uh, this right here, this 208i, uh, the preamps compared to the Rodecaster Pro, they're in a totally different class, and it's not even fair to talk about them. And I'm not saying the Rodecaster Pro is bad. What I'm saying is the Rodecaster Pro is a consumer product made to be plug and play. The Rodecaster Pro is just made for people who really don't know much of what they're doing to be able to get get really good sounding audio with minimal work and manage their podcast. And it's a miracle for that. That thing is awesome. I don't own one, but I've used them and I've been around them. They're awesome. The preamps to me, they sound plastic. They sound sterile. They sound uninteresting, uninspiring. Whereas the preamps in this, Tascam, and you may not know Tascam very well, apart from like the portable audio recorders. Since the 70s, Tascam has been one of the leading brands in professional audio. They're in pro-grade studios. And only in the last few years have they really started to make a push into the prosumer grade market. And what you're getting for this 208i it's 400 bucks. And there's no doubt about it. It's expensive, right? When you're used to spending 100, 150 bucks on, on an interface. Uh, what you're getting for this is professional grade audio for a prosumer price point and then the software in addition to it. Um, so, and, and exactly, Paul, if that was you, the Rodecaster Pro is a miracle, right? Plug it in, you plug everything on, it pretty much does itself. But you would not believe the difference. Now, having said that, will your audience suddenly notice a huge difference in your audio simply because you upgraded your preamp? Probably not. So the question is, is it worth doing? And as far as I'm concerned, the answer is yes. It's worth having the best audio you can afford and you can produce because it's the right thing to do. Because if we are podcasters, live streamers, cr- content creators, if we care about audio, if we care about it, then for the 10% of our audience that also does, we get to over delight them. 90% of the audience will never notice or care. They wouldn't know if I was recording audio just on my phone's microphone, right? But for the 10% who really notices and really cares, they will be so happy and so grateful. Anytime you can over delight just a few people, you're going to win in the long run. So I'm a big fan of saying, even if people mostly can't tell, yes, you should be producing the best quality you can afford and that you're capable of according to your skill level and what you know, um, because you're a content creator and it's the right thing to do. Um, Ollie, would I trust the interface for podcasting? Yes, and I have. I've rec- I have recorded a handful of podcasts with big dream guests using this exact interface just earlier this year, in fact. Um, I, uh, yeah, in fact, I recorded with this, I think I, I feel like I recorded with Cal Fussman. Um, I think I did my my episode with Cal Fussman on the Beyond Networking podcast, and he is someone I've been trying to get on the podcast for over two years. He's a legendary journalist. He's not a household name, but in the industry, legend, and I mean legend among legend legends. Um, Cal Fussman, let me uh, let me pull this up here. Let me uh, let me stop sharing the mixer and share the uh, the podcast here. Yeah. Um, Cal was my season finale for season three, and you'll see here, by the way, if you want to listen to something awesome, just go listen to this, this episode. Here you go. Award-winning journalist, New York Times bestselling author. He was the writer at large for Esquire magazine. Well, he still is, but the writer at large for Esquire magazine, where for decades he interviewed Mikhail Gorbachev, Jimmy Carter, Ted Kennedy, Jeff Bezos, Quincy Jones, Muhammad Ali, Kobe Bryant, you name it, he's interviewed them. He gets the best interviews um he is just just incredible and and he is uh in my field in my industry this guy is the 
king of interviewing. So to interview a legendary interviewer was so scary. And, you know, these people have limited time. They're giving me an hour of their time. I got to nail it. I got no choice. I used this interface, I'm pretty sure, if I remember right, for that for that particular podcast. So, yeah, I, I would I would trust it. Um, totally trust it. Um, I use interfaces for almost all of my podcasts uh, remotely. All of it, I, I use an interface for. I don't I don't record onto a um, onto anything physical. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, I think you're talking about uh, when I said you should have the best quality audio, uh, no matter what, because it's the right thing to do. Um, yes, and Craig, acoustic treatment. Yeah, <laughs> the VSM7 here is everything, including the waterfall. As it should, that is exactly what it's designed to do, right, Craig? A, a, a large diaphragm condenser is so sensitive, it's designed to hear everything. Now, I've already filmed a lesson for the Podcasting for Professionals course that deals with um, room treatment you can do without spending any money. So basically finding the right room in your house or designing your space with stuff you already have. I will include at some point a dedicated lesson on um, exactly how to set up your treatment. Uh, for what it's worth, in the meantime, I don't know, Craig, if you've watched, but I have a video, a full unedited interview with an acoustical engineer, uh, John, over at GIK Acoustics, who did my room. Um, and if you like the sound of my room, uh, you should go watch that interview I did with him. It's here on this channel and I was doing the interview with him before I put up all the treatment in this room, and he talked us through everything. You'll learn a ton from him. I'll probably take those principles we talked about in that and turn it into a good 15-minute, 20-minute comprehensive lesson on what to be aware of when it comes to acoustic treatment. Acoustic treatment is actually not as complicated as people think it is if you're going for home studio treatment. When you're talking about music studios or like NPR, it's a different story, right? But what we're trying to do, um, we can uh, we we can do it on on reasonable budgets. Uh, but there are some things to definitely look out for. So, Paul, I don't know Acoustic Mate, so I can't say if I'm a fan or not. Um, if there's something you think I should check out, send me and uh, send me an email. So yeah, I don't uh, I don't know Acoustic Mate, uh, but you know there's there's a bunch of good companies. I ended up uh, collaborating with GIK Acoustics, who have won me over for life. You know, fan for life with what they did in here. Um, this is a trick. This is a tricky room, and I made a series of vlogs on my main channel about uh, where I built out this room over the over the course of four vlogs in a row. That's on my main channel, and uh, you'll hear me talk through why this was such a tricky room. Um, uh, over the course of that uh, that video, uh, those vlogs. Craig, you're hanging blackout sound curtains. Yeah, okay, so blackout sound curtains for windows and doors. So I have black uh, behind me. These are blackout sound curtains. And over here that you can't see, those are blackout sound curtains. So that's what I did for my windows as well. Um, and C stands with acoustic sound blankets to surround the work area. Yeah, see, this is where acoustic treatment gets interesting. That's going to... It's going to solve one of your problems while making a different problem even worse. And this is what I'll end up doing a, a detailed lesson on probably. Um, the short version is it's going to solve or maybe not solve, but dramatically improve the issue you're having with reflections, with sound bouncing around and coming back into the mic, right? You're going to improve that. What you're going to do is create a lot of extra low end, a lot of extra bass buildup in your recording. Suddenly, you're going to have all this extra bass. And it's not clear or intuitive why that's true. Most people I say that to have no idea why I'm saying that. What happens, and this is the quick version, is sound has size. Small high-pitched high, high -pitched frequencies are very, very small and thin. So they'll get absorbed by that blanket because that blanket is only this thick, right? It's this thick. So the high pitch frequencies will get absorbed by those blankets. But low frequencies are huge. Low sound waves are huge. They will not get absorbed by a blanket. And so what happens is putting sound blankets all around you, you'll kill the reflections. That's good. And you'll absorb all the high pitch frequencies 
but you won't absorb any of the low pitch frequencies. So you'll create this massive off balance of all these low frequencies that are getting into your recording, but none of the high ones are. And it's just gonna, it throws off the balance and you end up having to do a lot of EQ in post to correct for that. So that's the quick version of uh, what's going on there. Um, <laughs> hey, it'll help with reflections, that's for sure. Uh, to, to deal with balance in the room, if you want to capture low frequencies, you need physically larger things. Couches, mattresses, things like that. Should do a video about productivity on your main channel. You know what? I should do a video about productivity. Ali, thank you for that. I will keep that in mind. Uh, you know what? That'll be a good one to do in the throes of having an infant in the house because uh, it's not like I'm taking a break. In October... I already have 10 virtual events for clients all over the country and some internationally. I, uh, I, uh, I also have one-to-one uh, -one coaching clients, uh, TEDx speaking clients and business coaching clients that I have uh, in October. And I also have a brand new mastermind, an eight-week mastermind starting just next week for a, a big client, a, a big client. Um, so I have a lot of work and I'm trying to also maintain my, you know, this channel and my main channel. And I have a weekly blog that I have to maintain and, and I'm going to have a crying baby in the house and be on very little sleep. So probably in the throes of that exhaustion, it would be a good time for me to do a video on productivity and how to work, uh, more efficiently, um, which is really the key to productivity. Uh, and planning. Um, cheap and easy way of dealing with noise coming into a room from the ceiling. Oh, you mean reflection? Uh, you have to t tell me. You mean reflections bouncing off the uh, the ceiling and coming back down and and hitting the mic? Let let me know if that's what you're asking, uh, Stephen. I'll I'll get back to you. Um, I, I think you're asking about noise coming. Uh, are you asking about noise coming from the floor above you, like up an apartment kind of a thing, or or like a, a second floor, or about reflections bouncing off the ceiling? Let, let me know. Oof, concrete or tile, that is not ideal. Get an area rug right underneath where your microphones are. Get anything. Go to get a shaggy, a shaggy area rug from Walmart. A uh, shaggy rug. If you're getting an area rug, make sure it's uh, shaggy, not the really tight woven office ones. Those will just bounce audio off of them and it'll reflect. Um, change the angles in the room so there are no square corners. Very, very smart. Square corners are a big problem. That's why I have these uh, oops, uh, wrong side. That's why I have going up the corners in the back here, these big, huge um, uh, base traps are at the corners to uh, to deal with some of that. Uh, I will be crying more than the baby. I love it. Uh, I'm sure that's true. Yep. I, I, Craig, I've heard it from everybody. I have a feeling everybody makes their plans about, here's how I'm going to deal with this stuff when I become a parent, and then kid comes and all bets are off, right? So uh, noise coming in from the outside. <sighs> yeah, noise coming from the outside is tough, man. Uh, they, The best I could offer there is to say you would need to basically pin to the ceiling sound blocking blankets or sound blocking panels. Now, sound treatment and sound proofing are two totally different things. What you need is sound proofing material on the ceiling. And I don't know very much about sound proofing. So that all I can do is, is offer to you, start to look into sound proofing, not sound absorption, not sound treatment, right? Sound treatment is to balance and deal with the internal space of a room. Sound proofing is to keep sound from getting from your room out and from out inside, right? Very different, but people get them confused all the time. So check out sound proofing. Shaggy dog, Craig. All right, listen, uh, this has been so much fun. Uh, really appreciate y'all being here. I know a handful of you said you wanted to get in on beta that would mean the world to me. I'd be really, really, uh, I'd really appreciate that. So send that email to audio101cc at gmail.com with beta there. Um, and if you're planning on doing that, by the way, don't don't buy the Audio 101 course if you're planning on doing this beta with me. Uh, almost everything included in the Audio 101, almost everything in the Audio 101 course for content is included in the podcasting for professionals. The only difference is in the Audio 101 course, I do have lessons specifically on dealing with audio with video. If you need that, maybe check it out. But 
all the audio stuff is is in the big one, which is why once the course launches full in like January, I'm going to offer to everyone who already owns the Audio 101 course the full $97 price discount off of the podcasting for professionals because there's so much overlap. I'm going to say to everyone who already owns the Audio 101, hey, you paid 100 bucks for this. I'm going to offer you that 100 bucks off of this new course if you want to come into this new course um, because because of that overlap. I think that's the right thing to do. So, all right, Ali and uh, and and everybody else, Steve and Paul and Craig, thank you all for being here. This is so cool. And uh, if I don't pop in live or make any updates in the next week or so, it means the baby's here and I'm freaking out. Until next time, always remember our world is a shared experience. Every interaction is meaningful and every person you meet, even virtually, is important. So come back anytime to sound better and level up. And we'll see you very, very soon.